ready to get started. Uh, please save all your questions to the end or put them in Whova, and we'll take the questions um, about five minutes to the end of the presentation. Please. All right, great. Well, welcome everyone. Um, this session is um, Fire Roadmap for Tefka Exchange. And um, my name is Chris Muir. I'm with the Office of the National Coordinator for Health Information Technology. I'm the Standards Division Director. With me is Dave Pike, and he wears several hats, but he's here representing the recognized coordinating entity for the um, trusted, trusted Exchange Framework and Common Agreement and the pro overall project. And we'll talk more about what that means here in a minute. So um, today we're gonna be talking a little bit about what the Trust Exchange Framework is and how the initial exchange will take place. But we're also gonna talk about the role that FIRE will, will have in the future of TEFCA. And then also um, Dave's gonna talk about the authorization and authentic authentication, <laughs> I'm sorry, okay. uh, yeah, uh, approach to, to FIRE Exchange under TEFCA. So um, the, the lawyers tell me, um, you know, I'm a federal employee. We have to have the disclaimers. Um, what I'm doing today, we're not making any announcements. I'm gonna take off my mask. I just realized I don't need to wear it. Um, there, we're not making any major announcements here. We're not making any policy. If we say anything that's different in the official documentation in the trust exchange framework or, or in the common agreement or the um, QHIN technical framework, um, those documents control. Um, this PowerPoint presentation is not an official document. So I'm gonna just spend just a moment talking about what TEFCA is, what the project is. So back in, I believe it was in 2016, it's been a while now, 20, um, the 21st Century Cures Act was passed. It was during the Obama administration, that's how long ago it was. But um, we, um, received some direction, among other things, we received some direction where we needed to develop a trust exchange form framework and a common agreement to enable all of the health information exchange networks to interact with each other. Congress is very concerned about this and, and they wrote this into law. So um, ONC sets policy and overall direction. I'm sorry. Somebody's drawing on the screen. Could we get that turned up? The capability turned off. Oh, interesting. <laughs> so anyway, <clears throat> anyway, so um, ONC sets policy direction and and, um, <clears throat> and and just provides um overall guidance to the project. We entered into a cooperative agreement with the recognized coordinating entity, which is the Sequoia project. And that's who, who Dave represents here. And, um, and they actually implement the overall, um, the, the common agreement, they decide who the QHINs are gonna be through a vetting process, and they um, make sure that they implement the, the um, QHIN technical framework, and just make sure all, all those things work. The QHINs are, are networks that have um, other health information networks and other um, participants underneath them. And the participants and sub-participants, they choose which QHIN they sign up under based on things like services and costs and, you know, just other things like that. So um, under um, the QHIN, or I mean, sorry, the, the, um, the common agreement, there is certain um, exchange purposes that are, are gonna be supported. And some of these include um, treatment, payment, and healthcare operations, which are very similar, or well, well, really, they're, they're basically the same as laid out in, in HIPAA, although anyone participating have, you know, have to respond to those. Um, we also will be doing some work with um, our federal partners with, and other partners with public health and also um, the government benefits determination. So, the, so we're gonna identify what those use cases are in the future and publish those. And um, also um, um, we, we're gonna enable individual access services. So individual access services and treatment are gonna be the first two um, exchange purposes that will be enabled under um, TEFCA. And the only other thing I'll mention here is that we just published not too long ago, a blog on um, 
healthit.gov that lays out the timing of each of these um, exchange purposes when, when they will be implemented. So the um, components of the technical, um, the QHIN technical framework is laid out here. And I'm not gonna go into too much detail here, but there's a few things I do wanna point out. So initially, um, the QHIN technical framework spells out um, patient discovery, um, the ability to, to query and, and you know, receive the query, and also to do direct messaging. And when we're doing these largely using IHE profiles, so like XCPD for um, patient discovery, XCA for the exchange and the query and exchange, and then um, also the XCDR um, for point to point. <clears throat> And, and the idea is that the reason why we, we started with those is that's really what's available and what's actively functioning right now. And so we want to start with what um, is commonly, commonly available in the market, but also um, our idea is to, you know, to implement fire and other new technologies um, going forward. And, um, and speaking of such, we, you know, we, we wanted to, quickly and, and right away talk about um, the fire and the role that fire will play in the in the near future. So we, we developed a fire roadmap with a three-year plan. Um, it, it, it came out with, in January along with the, the um, trust exchange framework, the common agreement, the QHIN technical framework, and, um, and you know, of course the fire roadmap. Um, and there's three stages to this, and each stage is roughly a year. So in the first stage, you know, it's the IHE profiles, but um, there can be, and, and it's allowed to do out-of-band coordination to exchange um, fire resources and fire documents. Um, in stage two, um, we're going to enable point-to-point um, -point exchange, but, um, but also enable... Um, Network facilitated exchange, which means um, still provide that patient discovery and do orchestrated um, security. And that's what Dave will be talking about here in a minute. And, and then in stage three, it's all, you know, it will include brokered um, fire API exchange, um, um, multi hop, you know, multi tiered, those kinds of things. Um, and, and so what we're gonna do is we're gonna start off by releasing a fire IG for, for TEFCA. We're gonna get public comment on it and this will take place um, this summer. We're gonna convene a group of people who will, or a, a group of, of people who will be not only giving us feedback on the IG, but actually will be piloting the, the IG. And then we will be um, releasing the final IG towards the end of the year, this calendar year. And then, um, and, and also during that time in the next six, six to eight months, now we're gonna be also piloting, I, I forgot that part. And, um, and then the following year, we're gonna be piloting the, the broker exchange and then releasing a final Q-tip. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dave. Thanks, Chris. All right, now comes the fun part. This is the fun part for me. Um, just to let you know, I am the principal officer of the QHIN technical framework, which means if you love it, please let me know. If you hate it, please stop throwing things. I have to stop getting the bruises. They're too, getting too hard to explain. Um, what we're gonna be talking about now is point to point fire over TEFCA. This will be done through the leaf node. So anyone without going through the QHINs can can do fire. There are a few basic requirements and due to the scale of the network, obviously we need to automate as much as possible of the authx for the authentication authorization can't be done out of band. There are going to be thousands, tens of thousands of, of organizations connected. To do that, we're using the unified data access protocols, UDAP. Uh, I'm not going to explain all of UDAP here. I'm not an expert on UDAP, that's Louis Ma. I will give you his email address if you have lots of questions. What I am going to talk about is the requirements specific to TAFCA that are through the JOTS and such that will need to be done. Uh, the first one, of course, is that 
all of the jots will be signed with a TEFCA certificate. This will be generated through uh, the QHINs and filtered on down. It will be based on a root cert uh, generated by the, by the RCE, the, Re the Recognized Coordinating Entity Sequoia Project. And that will bring, make sure that everything is part of the trusted framework that is TEFCA. So when you create the JOTS for UDAP, it won't be a, a organizational cert or self-signed cert. It will be an official TEFCA chained certificate. You will need to have one done that. Um, again, as I said, RC is redoing, reviewing the use of UDAP. And you can see there's, there's the Fire IG. It has not yet been published, uh, version two that is. Uh, it, it will be specific to that one because there were some issues that came up, obviously, which is why we do SDUs. Um, mostly UDAP automates yeah, the client ID issuance, works well with Smart on Fire. So once you have your client ID, how that will work, you can use, um, you can use Smart on Fire. And we say that to make Josh stop pacing back and forth. And of course, um, the biggest thing is this is not yet written in stone. This is our current thinking, okay? This is to get you interested and start the feedback process. If you have questions, we will have lots of time for questions at this because, well, this is our current thinking. We need to get information back from you, okay? So step one, as I said, all JOTs will need to use the TEFCA cert in their Jose. It's absolutely required. UDAP authorization will be necessary to get your client ID. Not surprising, because it's where we use UDAP. All data exchange will be US core requirements. 311, you should, that should not surprise anyone. It's written in the regulation now. It's not going to change. Um, Non-discrimination. If you have a TEFCA cert, you, and you are there with an acceptable uh, exchange purpose, it has to be permitted. How that's going to be done, there are SOPs being written, there are all kinds of things to work it out. But for now, the basic rule is, if it's got a TEFCA cert and it's supposed to have a TEFCA cert, you have to respond appropriately based on you know, the requirements of the, of the CA and of the Cuban technical framework. And the last one is the provenance resource because very few store things in fire. A provenance resource must be must accompany this so that how it's been transformed, who transformed it, what transformed it, blah, all the things that you put in a provenance resource is there. Confidence in that data and it allows for trace back. How, you know, how did it get there? These are all the requirement, the basic requirements. There will be more. I'm not finished writing. All right. So working with UDAP has its own requirements, okay? RFC 7515 for JOTS, uh, the weight web tokens, you know, 7519, conform to JWS header, blah, blah, blah. Um, I'm gonna keep restating this whole use your TEFCA cert because we do have a lot of people confused on that point. Um, digitally signed permitted signature algorithms, are, you know, RSA or elliptic curve, at least 256 bits. Include the signer's TEFCA cert in the XFC and serialized using compact uh, serialization as part of 7515. 7, All of these are nothing new. This is part of the base requirements of UDAP and base requirements of using JOTS and all of that wonderful thing now. Okay, let's go into some of the more fun things. And by fun, I mean how we're going to all do all this. Okay. Fire server must make its authorization server. Sorry, I'm not used to having the screen in front of me end up there. So it's a little, this is the first time I've done a presentation in front of a live audience. Does it show? Anyway, fire server must make its server's authorization token and endpoints available as we expect. Okay, that's in the well-known. You must have the token endpoint auth methods and that has to have private key jot, right? Basic UDAP because that's what we're using. Uh, you, you know, and then we follow the UDAP profiles. All, again, all of this will be published in the next couple of weeks. Um, it's going through the final editing process. It should have a publication request to the HL7 technical server, uh, 
uh, steering committee. That's part, uh, part of my, my work uh, in the next few weeks and we should get it out. But for now, I'm going over it. Uh, there are the basic profiles, which are dynamic client registration, uh, job-based client authentication using UDAP. If you're going to use smart, obviously these things can change, but you will need to get your client ID using UDAP protocol. Um, and then again, if the grant type supported parameter has a string client credentials, I'm gonna shrink this down because, sorry, you can't see it, but it's blocking the text. Uh, client credentials, then you have to have UDAP Auth Z for UDAP client authorization grants and using Jeb web, web tokens. If the server supports user authentication workflow, then you have to have UDAP TO as for tiered OAuth. Now that's because we, at the beginning, right, we're doing facilitated. That's point to point at the leaf nodes. All right, so to get this, and if you're going to use individual access services, tiered OAuth, it's going to work, which means you send the information over, the CSP sends up a, a nice little screen to, to the user, which pops up, says, put your username and password in, and away it goes. Again, that's just what we're looking forward to. I'm not sure how exactly how we're going to work on this because a lot of this is still in discussion. And of course, you have to put your endpoints in well-known UNAP with authorization endpoints, token endpoints, all of those listed here. Are you loving this so far? Yeah? How many of you hate this idea? On a show of hands, on a scale of one to 10, how much do you hate this? 17? Oh, wait, six, seven? All right, I'm, I can live with that. All right. Okay, dynamic registration. Now the, Again, I'm going to keep harping on this. So HL7 UDAP Fire IG has a custom registration for B2B. Again, not dealing with individual access services at this point. And goes through, has the basic keys here, ISS, client app operators identifying, base UR for UDAP, all right? The sub is same as ISS, all right? So that's a little bit different for those of you who love, you know, others. Uh, the authorization uh, service registration endpoint is in odd. EXB has expiration time. We recommend that's no more than five minutes, right? Partially because you're, you know, if you are going to be part of you, you know, if you're a larger organization and you're going to be part of Tefka, you may get a lot of requests. So having them expire quickly will just keep sanity in the in the system. Uh, the IAT is issued at time. You know how this works. JTI, uh, you know, replay. Uh, the client name is a string, should be a human readable string. Uh, the redact URIs is an array. If grant types, of course, has authorization code. If they're not there, then uh, response types, same. Omit for client credentials, it's array of strings. Token endpoint auth method, uh, private key jot, right? That is, that is how UDAP works, is private key jots. And of course, scope. That's, you know, we follow the same scopes that, it, that OAuth uses. You can, you know, work with those. They're fairly straightforward. Okay. Everybody likes examples. Here's an example. Uh, the algorithm RS-256, that's a shell. You must support RS-256. Everything else is a good idea, right? If you want to get stronger, you cannot get weaker than RS-256. So if you're using elliptic curve or if you're using RS-384, those are not required, but RS-256 absolutely is. X5C has your Tefka search. I put four, four characters in. Did you want more? Uh, and then we go through, you know, showing example.com, my user B2B app for sub is the same. Going through it, the expiry in, in and those lo lovely numbers, someday they're gonna convert those to times humans can read too. Um, the JTI is a random value just because you're gonna have lots of them. So trying to keep them all straight with something, it's probably easier just to do random and keep track of that that way. Uh, we have the contacts, you can put your logo in. Uh, grant types, authorization code, refresh token. Then we go back to code for response types. Again, token endpoint, auth method is private key jot. And then scope, we have patient read, we have, you know, we have, we have procedure read. 
And then of course, how you post it, you have the software statement, same as you would for UDAP in general, certifications, which is array of more jots, and then that magic UDAP one saying that this is UDAP compatible. We, we don't want to blindside people. Again, if you want more detail, uh, currently it's on build.fire.org um, for, for, for the whole UDAP Fire IG. You're going to need to read that. Like, as I said, I would love to sit here and explain it to you, but I'm not the expert. And I'm sure Louis Ma would love to take the opportunity to explain it one more time because he's done it lots. Okay, so server response is fairly straightforward. 201 created, it's a JSON, it's got your client ID, your software statement is echoed back. Uh, client name is string, whatever, whatever the string is. Redirect type, which is, it gives you back the array of URIs that you need, response type, and then of course, token endpoint off method stays private key jot. Okay. Because we are working with, with B2B, UDAP defines the B2B, the HL7 B2B extension. It used to be customized, but now it is um, HL7 B2B. This is following the client credentials flow. And this was created originally under the care quality world. It was brought into the HL7 and it's being brought into Tefka from there because there's just that much extra information that is necessary. Um, the JSON object includes this extension object as part of the authentication jot and it has the key name HL7 B2B. Um, originally it had, it was called care quality, but don't tell anybody. Uh, this is absolutely required to follow the TEFCO requirements and it links your organization back to the RCE directory or the, which is cached by the QHINs, which blah, blah, blah. And the user requesting information. So all of that information is passed on. So those going through TEFCO, right? Cause it's going to be looped around originally but going direct says, this is who's requesting the data. It's not just the organization. You can know that, you know, Dr. Bob is the one who's requesting this, right? And that's really, really helpful when you're trying to track down where the, your data went. All right, for the B2B extension, again, these are just the Tefka specific things. There are more things in heaven and earth Horatio that I'm dreamed of in your technology. Never mind. Um, version is required fixed at version one because we're using UDAP version one for this. Uh, well, not for UDAP version one, we're using the extension is version one. Uh, the organization ID, that is a link back to the RCE directory. So, and it will be the fully qualified. So that way, when it is received, the, re the responding organization can take that string, go check it and do things like match the purposes of use to make sure they're allowed to use those purposes of use and other information to make sure that you can validate it. Uh, the organization is required, it's just a string. You, know, you can put veterinarian's hospital in it to match your organization ID if you work for veterinarian's hospital. Uh, subject ID, that's the, the user who's requesting it. So if, if Dr. Bob is requesting the information, their name goes there. Purpose of use. Um, this is one of the defined purposes of use, the six that Chris explained. They're also listed in the QTF, they're listed in the CA, and I probably have them tattooed somewhere on my body because I've seen them so many times. Consent policy. This is the exciting one. This is an OI which says which format the consent policy is in. And that may be anyone, it can be a Kantar consent receipt, it can be a fire consent resource, it can be X, uh, ZACML, there we go, not XML. If, if you can do it in XML, let me know. I'd like, like to read your, read your specification. Um, but it is represented by one of the OIDs. These are also listed in the QTF. And a consent reference, this is where you go to get it because it is not, will not be included directly. It will be fetched, processed. And if you cannot process it, same as anywhere else, then you kind of say, well, I'd, love, I'd like to process your, your request, but that's impossible. All right. I'm talking very quickly. Am I talking too quickly? No, good. Because that's it. <laughs> uh, if you have questions, fire away. If you have more questions, uh, there's lots of places to, to drop them off.
and you can call inquiry.healthit.gov and they'll make it to Chris and then Chris will send them on to the RCE and they may actually end up in my hand. Hi, this is Madhav Gona. I'm uh, from Health Plus New York Insurance Company. Hi. What is the impact on the payers for the TEFCA? Well, um, the, the, the impact, um, they, they can participate. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm not sure what you're, I mean, I don't know what else you want me to say about it. Um, but, um, they, you know, they can um, be, you know, part of the TEFCA network. No, they'll be like a, a participant or sub participant. Here, let me. Yeah. The, the, the first thing to realize, I, I guess, is the big one is that who's going to be QHIN will be a very small set, right? To be a QHIN and the requirements for this just was released a month ago? Month? Yeah, about a month ago. This is not a small undertaking. Uh, you're expecting tens of millions a month, right, transactions, because you're going to be the backbone, right? There will be probably 10, give or take. Don't take that number as gospel. I'm making it up. Uh, QHINs who will be responding to queries all over the country constantly. So it is not expected that organizations such as payers, such as most HIEs, uh, will be. A few organizations have announced that they will. eHealth Exchange has decided Health Gorilla wants to be one. There are a few others out there. But payers would, would be participants or sub-participants. Um, they would, of course, go under the, the, you know, the, payment, the payment use case once that is in place. Uh, that won't be released for a little while yet. So, David? Oh, hey, because you're a friend and colleague, I'm going to ask you a question that's probably going to be a recurring question coming from me. I didn't which, do it. Which is, uh, is there a, a reference implementation or a, a testing plan for folks who are going to need to implement these um, in the future? At, in the future? Well, yeah, in the, in, we haven't way finished to writing future. this, so that's kind of you know difficult to say. As as a, you weren't here for the for the opening, but um, the the reference we have. Bleh. Let me start that sentence again. UDAP has not been finalized, right? The, the UDAP version two is due to be published soon. It is going through final reconciliation of comments. Once it is done, then UDAP will be out there and you can all read it, love it and implement it. Um, once that is done, then we can start looking at TEFCA. But again, until the Fire IG, there really can't be any kind of reference implementation. I do know that some of the, uh, the QHINs will be very quickly jumping on this. But again, most of it is basic, basic UDAP with customizations, right? It's mostly the certificate and the B2B extension has specifics. So if you can do UDAP, you should be good. Preston. Yeah. Hey, uh, a bit of a technical question because I, I think I followed the gist of all of the OAuth related stuff, but I can't like mentally cite everything. <laughs> um, but um, for, so for people that actually distribute their software, like yeah. an entirety, and so using mobile apps as an example of this, like, is there anything in those specific OAuth flows that re would require the, like the static embedding of a private key or any form of secret that could then be extracted by a bad actor to spoof a client? There is, there is no requirement. Again, the, the individual access services is still being discussed how that's gonna go through, uh, but it will use the, we are working on how that's going to be done. I can't really say because it's still very early in discussions for fire and individual access. Uh, we are working on the B2B use case right now and getting that out the door. Yeah. Sorry, I'd give you a better answer, but no I can't yet. Uh oh, now I'm in trouble. <laughs> I, I tried to pace in a way that would put the pillar between me and you. <laughs> uh, so, I, I this is not really a fire roadmap specific question, okay. but but this plays out in fighter two, like yeah. maybe most acutely because it's the thing that I can talk about. Really, but, like, I it is know. very I know that. it's very hard to wrap my head around. individual organizations 
Okay. <laughs> um, really, that's uh, the, the hard part. Is is how to how to secure all the all the participants and sub participants below the Q hins, um, and unfortunately, there's no easy answer for that one. Um, there are requirements. There's the security privacy SOP. I know. Oh no, undoubtedly, and that's going to be a problem, and that's a problem with any healthcare network, right? The minute somebody, you know, somebody's clinic gets hacked, that clinician, unfortunately, there's no easy answer to that one. That is something that's going to be worked out. There are requirements at the QHIN level, but there are limits to how far policy can be pushed down for security and privacy. Is there a patient opt-out story? Like, if I just, if, if I don't want to be part of this system because I'm worried about those kinds of concerns, like, is there a way I can just say no? Chris, I don't have an answer to that one. <laughs> um, I, I don't have a good answer for you right now. We're, those are the things that we're still working out, but um, yeah. I mean, I, the, the term privacy by design, like, is a good one that encompasses some of this thinking. I would say, like, having a story in place before moving forward with the live deployment would make me a lot more comfortable as a, as a patient in the system. Okay. The, the short answer is there are additional SOPs coming. Those aren't, I'm, I'm just the tech geek, so I don't have access to some of the tighter policy aspects. Thank you. I apologize for a sharp-pointed question. No, no, it's, it's an excellent question, one that needs further consideration. Preston. Yeah, is there just a, any sort of general guided philosophy without throwing too many darts, but you know, from a privacy standpoint on the ability of, to write into such a federated system. And so as a, like a personal use case, I'm the type of person who poisons my own wells. So like, if you look me up on LinkedIn or social media sites, I have fake info intentionally seeded because I have identity theft issues. And so, you know, is, is, are there any philosophies then on people <laughs> that do this sort of thing, you know, to intentionally corrupt, you know, a federated system with either false data or, you know, other or sorts of use cases, that, negative use cases. Well, the, the biggest one and, and users, especially in individual users are likely to be IAL2. So to, just to use it as an individual access service is again, not finalized. Please take this with it, but IAL2 will be required because we have to have confidence that the person's using this is actually valuable right, is actually the person they say they are. That's, again, we're working through that. An IS SOP will be released sometime in the, in the I believe, short term. Um, and so that kind of thing will be part of it. To be, to be an individual access service user, you need to be IAL2. That's 863A for those of you who love reading this document. And if you are, please leave the room. You are dangerously insane. Um, so, so that kind of thing will be mitigated to a large extent because in order to participate, you've already been vetted as an individual and your demographics that will be used will be part of that vetting. It will be part of the negotiation to provide the vetted attributes as part of the queries. So there's, there's a limited amount of pollution that can be done. Of course, uh, you know, somebody who works hard enough can do that all they want. However, um, again, there's limited things we can do, right? With 350 million participants in theory, you know, if, you know, one tenth of one hundredth of 1% can screw things up, they'll find a way. And we'll, again, this whole thing is iterative. We will get industry feedback. We will make it better. We will bring more information in, make it, you know, there will be QTF version 1.1, 1.2, 2.0 for all I know. 17.6 if we need to go that far because there are con concerns and, and there will be technical issues that need to be tackled. Down in front. Uh, wait, 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 you need a microphone so people can, the home audience can hear you. Sure. I have a, a question about like the umbrella of responsibility. <laughs> so going back to the, like the umbrella slide, it sounds like the RCE has the root cert, right? And then they uh, generate uh, child certs for the QHIN, yeah. 
right? And then beyond that, it's the QN's responsibility to create certs for the participants. And then the sub uh, participants, those certs are created by the participants, right? No. No? no. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, the the QHIN will be responsible for issuing certs for everybody in their network. Everyone. Everyone. So okay. every participant, every sub participant will use a QHIN generated cert seeded by the RCE cert. So the QHIN could be responsible for generating thousands of certs. They're, yep, yep. They're going to need to have a CA set up and ready. Again, if you're not willing to put thousands of hours of effort into this, you probably shouldn't be a QHIN. Got it. Thanks. Uh oh. No, I think this is an easy one. Oh, um, and I, I don't even think there's a right answer or a wrong answer. So I, I'm just curious. Um, 17. Like, that's not bad. Um, <laughs> in this architecture, yeah. it's very clear that QHINs need to have certificates so they can you know, engage in all these interactions. Could somebody build a QHIN where they said, well, we're not going to issue certificates to our participants and sub-participants. You know, we, we got some other way to manage who they are. We're going to transit all the requests through us. And of course, we'll use our QHIN cert to do all the signing. Is, is that allowed in this architecture or do QHINs have to be CAs in the sense they, that- you They have to be CAs. And, and they have to issue individual level certs down to every to healthcare every, provider- Every organization, every hospital. Every, everybody wow. in their, their network will be required to have, uh, have a cert just to secure it. Again, because we're doing leaf point to point, right? Those certs will need to be from the sub-participant or participant or whoever's below this, the, the QHIN in order to, to sign their job. Interesting. Down in front again. Sorry, uh, one more cert, uh, question. Yeah. So what happens when certs expire? Like, is there a plan for like a so, rollout? Cert, cert expiry, all of that will be managed by the QHIN. Okay, so uh, that's on them too? Yeah. Yeah, yeah OCSP, all of that, they're, they're, all of that will be managed. Yeah, that's a lot of certs, yeah. <laughs> Um, I have one question from the uh, Q, uh, Uva. Can you clarify fire stage one? Is this essentially calling out the ability to embed fire content within the HIE XCA and XCDR profiles? Yes. Uh, by prearrangement, you can send fire, fire through XCA if that's what you really want to do. Uh, that's built into XCA. You can request specific con uh, formats through an XCA. So if there's a fire document, remember those? If you People talk about them, I've never seen one used. If, if there's a fire document available and there's a, a CDA available, you can request the fire document because you can request specific format. This would have to be done out of band because in most cases that's not available. Uh, and you can, I mean, in theory, you can send fire resources directly through XCA. Fire over XCA does exist. It has been implemented in parts of the world and we don't doubt their, their sincerity. The sanity, but not their sincerity. I have a quick follow up. Um, I'm still wrapping my head around this, as you can see. Yeah. The the certificate issuance story that you just told. Am I right in thinking it's not fire specific at all? That all that exists even in the uh, sort of X, XCA. World yeah. Too. In yeah. the IH, okay. in the IHE transaction world, it, it was it will be there. Oh, down by the windows. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure uh, where this came in the presentation. I'm not sure which one of you mentioned this, but- um, It was you, Chris. Okay, so Chris, uh, uh, there you mentioned, maybe you mentioned <laughs> that uh, at one point, um, the Providence information is gonna be, the Providence resource is gonna yes. be required, yes. um, but also that fire is not required until a good way into the future. So what like uh, is, is Providence only required if you are transmitting via fire? Yes. Okay. And until then, like there's no there's, Providence yeah, information. There, uh, that... there, CDA Providence is at best in development. We'll, we'll, go, we'll use that. Uh, so there's no real way using base, uh, base XCA to send Providence information. Uh, however, most organizations are have been long set up to create a CCDA document and Many use it as you know their basic interchange. So it's it's where we're we're expecting CCDA to be transformed. Um, when you send it from a sub participant to a participant to a QHIN to a to do, and it ends up at fire resources, knowing that it was converted, how what what process was used to convert is vital. 
Um, that being said, within a QHIN network, how you do that is, you know, black box. We don't dictate how it, how a QHIN's network will work. However, between QHINs or between leaf nodes using, you know, facilitated fire, that you know that has to have a have a way to be traceable. I'm just going to use the rest of the time then if no one else. <laughs> Nobody else yeah. asks questions. You can come sit in the front. It saves time. So who who in in the in the Tefka model like is ultimately responsible for consent management of data elements that have some part particularly protected status around them, like HIV status or mental health, for nope. example. That doesn't change. That still falls falls under 42 CFR. That's still responsible of the of the data holder. Uh, what we've done is by creating the way of sending consent. So I release this information through a, a Kentar consent receipt, through a consent res resource, preferably consent resource. I may be biased by that. Um, so you can send over that saying, I release this information to Dr. Bob or Dr. Sue um, by sending, hey, here is what you need to fetch to, to release that information. Oh, the, you know, the two of you should just sit in front. <laughs> I, but you know, you keep telling me these interesting things and I realize there's more I don't understand. Um, in your table, the consents were in that B2B yep. um, extension, the consents were optional. Yes. Uh, can you say more about that? Well, if, if there's no need for consent, you don't have to send consent with every So if it's TPO or something, yeah. the idea is just the fact that it's coming from a good guy is enough for us to-, to Yeah, it's, it, that's standard TPO yep, through, yep. through every, every network. Thank you. So what's in it for the QHINs? Do Money. they get to charge? Okay. So their business model is charging. Um, Who? They don't charge each other. They're, not, they're forbidden to charge each other, but okay. how they run their own networks, what fees are related, things like that are, on, are very weakly specified as can't be extortion level. Got it. So that's where the competition is cost for the QHINs. Yeah, because there's going to be a massive cost to set up a QHIN. So they have to be able to recoup their costs somehow. If there are no further questions, everyone. <laughs> there are none on the on Hoover. So all right, great. Thank right. you. Did it. Thank you so much. Thank yeah, you. Thank you very much.